Um, so I'm Mr. Robinson. I'm a rising fourth year grad student in the HST program, working with uh, Maria Angela Franceschini on optical methods to measure brain blood flow samples. Um, so a little bit different from MRI, but uh, some of the challenges that we face in the optical domain are similar to what uh, I'm going to talk about today with respect to this physiology monitoring and how that can be helpful for fMRI data processing. Um, so I'd like to start with looking at the current state of clinical fMRI, um, and that's generally in pre-surgical mapping. So I'm showing a, a figure from a paper showing um, the response of the brain to a, a verbal task. And so the idea is to just avoid these areas when um, doing tumor resection so that um, the, the patient doesn't end up with a, a language disability following surgery. Um, and one of the key features that strikes me is, is why fMRI works really great for this is that you have a uh, this mapping that's leading to a robust response on a patient-specific basis um, that's easy to interpret in the anatomical framework of where language and the motor aspects of language and the cognitive aspects of language sit. Um, and then also the fact that the consequences of errors for this are, are quite large if, if this is done properly. Um, and so it's a very important technique to do. And so you know, looking at all these studies and everything, you would think you could use resting state fMRI data or task-based fMRI data to uh, sort of push the field to more uh, use cases in the clinic. And so looking at just a resting state uh, aggregated average across subjects, there seem to be these nice uh, network distributed distributions across, uh, across the subjects uh, in the average plot. Uh, but when you look at the variance between subjects, you have these, these areas that exhibit nice, conserved activity between um, different subjects and also these areas that have these, these really, really great variance of response. Um, and so understanding what might be happening in the resting state is, is, is difficult when you just have that imaging data. Um, and it's, it's something we've run into as well for, for our, our, our measurements. Um, and so the brain doesn't necessarily sit in a vacuum and we have this uh, feedback where uh, activities that the brain does that talk to the heart and talk to the lungs and as far as respiration and uh, delivery of blood to tissue uh, can influence the measurements that you take. And so you have all these connections of autonomic nervous system and, and then the feedback from baroreceptors and chemoreceptors. And so all of this feedback um, could definitely affect the signals that you're measuring. And I, that's something that I really want to emphasize with the uh, the results I present here, and uh, the, the methods that are used to, to uh, sort of suss out what's important and what's not important. Um, and so Jay gave a really good uh, brief introduction on the bold signal. So more or less what we want to get is the neuronal activity all the way on the left of this graph. And what we're using to get it is a few steps removed all the way on the right, looking at the hemodynamic response, uh, whether that's cerebral blood flow, cerebral blood volume, or the, or the bold signal. Um, and so like Jay was talking about, we have the, the different sources of noise in these signals. I'm going to be focusing on the, the physiologic noise that, uh, that he mentioned. Um, and so one category of physiological noise could be that that comes from non bold sources, so uh, motion artifact. Um, so pick this paper as, a, as a, an example of, of a way to, to really showcase that. So um, subvoxel so motion due to cardiac uh, pulsation can cause blurring in images and cause a spurious activations measured by the, um, keep clicking that to make sure it keeps playing, um, uh, in, in different regions of the brain. And so it's, it's more difficult to tell in these upper scans where the motion is more subtle, um, but when you use a scan sequence and an imaging processing algorithm that really, really highlights the motion, um, like they do for the bottom videos, you can see these really, really, really large, or what seem like really large uh, motions uh, now. Um, and so that gives you the, uh, variability maps that you can see on the right. And so the usual suspects of where that variability um, show up are, are the, the places near fluid filled spaces, um, uh, at boundary conditions and things of that nature. Uh, what's interesting here is that um, it's not necessarily just considered noise though. Uh, in this study, we can see differences in the way that the typical uh, brain is moving in response to the cardiac pulsations as compared to that of the, the brain with the Chiari malformation. So maybe the mechanical properties of the brain are different and that could be used as a diagnostic measure. Um, further things like uh, blood pressure or you know, intracranial pressure could also theoretically be sensed through these motion induced signals. Um, 
and that's a, an, another factor that makes this maybe not noise, but that could also be part of your signal. Um, and so we don't just have this, this non-bolt motion noise, we also have things that will affect the bolt signal itself. Um, so because we're so removed from what we're trying to measure, a lot of different factors can creep in into those feedback mechanisms. Um, and so one study that looked at it, uh, they examined the comparisons of fMRI data during sleep to things like EEG. Uh, there was concurrent uh, physiologic or peripheral physiological measurements we're using uh, photoplasmography to get heart rate and heart rate variability, as well as a chest strap to measure uh, respiration volume to look at those artifacts that might be induced. Um, and so the first thing that I want to show is a comparison of the PPG and EEG time courses. So the EEG time courses has the, have these stars that are marked cave complexes um, that are identified by expert eye. And uh, at each of those points, we can see that something is happening in the PPG signal. We're seeing a decrease in the, uh, the amplitude. Um, and so K-complexes are known to be times when the brain is putting out extra sympathetic tone. Um, and that could be acting on the vasculature, which is giving this PPG amplitude a change um, that uh, conceivably could also be happening to your cerebral blood flow response. And so if we take all of the different signals that we're measuring and then time lock them to the uh, the K-complex uh, first, we see that there's an uh, increase in low frequency activity of the EEG, a uh, uh, sort of surrogate measure for the complex uh, presence. And then in the uh, fMRI signal, we see a, a global decrease in, in the bolt signal um, following that activation of the sympathetic nervous system. And so um, if we understand more factors about the, the the things that were scanned, the people that were scanning, the brains were scanning in, the, in, in, a, in light of the whole body response to a particular stimulus, stimulus which could be more important in uh, more effective related disorders as opposed to maybe task-based things where you're just flashing lights and looking at your visual response. Um, it could be really interesting to, to look at how this more holistic view uh, can give you more information. And so uh, now I want to talk about ways that people have uh, implemented machine learning as algorithms to correct for these sorts of effects when we're not considered a signal, and then go through a few examples of how uh, fMRI could be useful in the clinic to uh, sort of uh, be more impactful, uh, more or less. So uh, a paper that came out quite a while ago uh, details uh, retrospective motion correction, which is I core. So if we go back to our motion map, um, we have an idea of how this motion is going to occur in our signal, and we expect it to be uh, periodic with the phase of the uh, cardiac pulsation as well as the respir respiration. And so if we model that as a sum of uh, cosines, sines and cosines of the Fourier representation, uh, by peripherally measuring the cardiac pulsation phase and the respiratory phase, we can then uh, pull out that motion-induced problem. And so we can go from a signal that has this uh, very sinusoidal quality to it, uh, to something that looks more representative of what we might expect from those brain regions, um, which is a nice thing to do for sure uh, in, those, in those areas where we really want to figure out what's going on in the brain center, say, where we have quite a bit of uh, motion artifact. Um, another more recent paper that's come out is looking at automatic de denoising of fMRI data in a data-driven data way. Um, so you take your, your scans, you apply the standard pre-processing steps, and then perform ICA across the, your images to decompose into these individual components. Um, and then you label these components as either signal or noise by expert review. And then based on different features of those independent components, as whether that be something about the frequency spectra of that, that uh, particular component, maybe the spatial extent of that component. Um, and you feed it through this multi-step classifier and then based on that, the classifier learns how to select out components that have features of noise and features of signal. And then you use that to remove uh, the noisy components from your, your uh, pre-processed data and move forward in how you do it. And that's, that's a, a, a feat. This, this uh, algorithm has been used in, in one of the studies that I'm gonna talk about next. Um, so maybe one important uh, way to look at the data would be biomarker discovery, or the way that we could use fMRI is biomarker discovery. Um, and so the central autogonomic memory rest seems like a pretty good place to start as the uh, looking at uh, autonomic tone in, in different conditions has been seen to be disturbed in some cases. Um, and so the 
the scans and, and the, the peripheral measures used here are resting state fMRI and then cardiac pulse data from the finger. Um, and so the cardiac pulse gives you heart rate and heart rate variability measures, and then the resting state gives you the network maps. And so we can compare the high frequency heart rate variability, uh, which is associated with very sympathetic uh, tone in the body and the heart rate to our fMRI measures and generate some correlation maps to look at where in the brain we might see different activation or different uh, correlations to those particular signals. Um, and this study was, was interesting in that it revealed uh, previously unfound uh, parts of the brain that are involved in this central autonomic network at rest and that perhaps adding a classifier to the end of these results could allow you to separate between uh, healthy controls and, and uh, patients with uh, pathologies. Um, and so if that indeed is a biomarker that's important and, and having parasympathetic tone is a, an important factor, uh, maybe you'd like to design a treatment strategy that could in, uh, increase that activation in a particular patient. And so um, this study looked at how stimulating the vagus nerve for the ear would give you uh, different responses in different uh, parasympathetic measures. So using really great scanners, so it's at 7T, so improvement of spatial resolution um, and SNR definitely, definitely helps um, as we try to pull out these, these sorts of uh, really, really small nuclei and, and really figure out what's going on. Um, and so using this, this, this really cool technique, um, we were able to find that specific portions in the brainstem were activated um, at, when you stimulated different parts of the respiratory cycle and that that activation induces a change in the heart rate variability you measure with peripheral measures and that there's a dose dependent response of heart rate variability change to changes seen in the fMRI data as a result of the stimulation and it's a, uh, a really cool uh, to me one-to-one -one sort of mapping of we tried this sort of treatment and we can see almost immediately that whether it's working or whether it's not working and then if that is something that could help a patient, that seems very, very impactful to me. Um, and then another way that you could use uh, machine learning is to is maybe classification sense of different data. And so um, one of the major sort of complicated things that we all do with on, uh, through life is, is pain. And how might we be able to look at objective markers of that subjective experience? Um, and so uh, the study took uh, several patients with chronic back pain and took pre-scans of, of, uh, of the patients and then had them do maneuvers to exacerbate the back pain and then did post-scans. Um, and then wanted to see, okay, can we train a classifier to distinguish pre and post pain? And so by using a multi-signal uh, multi approach, so taking the relative blood flow changes uh, taken by arterial spin labeled MRI, looking at connectivity uh, from the bold, uh, connectivity in the primary somatosensory cortex with the gold signal, and then looking at peripheral uh, heart rate variability, um, you could come to a point where you can measure or you can classify with, with pretty good accuracy and, and good area to the curve um, these different conditions within a patient and say that, okay, that was the pre scan and that was the post scan, or that was the post scan, that was the pre scan. Um, and not only that, by using the subject average uh, activation maps that come from each of the three. Uh, modalities, you could start to make um, objective guesses or, or estimations of the, uh, of the um, subjective experience of pain with, with fairly good accuracy in R of 4.63. Um, and so sort of incorporating all these different factors and using the physiological signal and the machine learning together, uh, I think can give a, a very good window into what's going on in the physiology. Um, and so some key takeaways. Uh, the brain doesn't exist in a vacuum, and the physiological responses can be very telling as far as what's going on in the, in the brain. Um, and in the way that it's been shown, characterization of the physiology can aid in data analysis and provide feedbacks to tell if treatments are working. And then uh, by using uh, this physiological data in the light of, of brain activity and using machine learning tools, you can help provide these indices of health, which is, I think, what we're very focused on today. I think it's really cool. Um, with that, I'll... Finish up on.